Well, good morning. As they have done for centuries, the church would be greeted with the phrase, He is risen, and the church would respond, He is risen indeed. Let's try it one more time. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Hey, welcome to uh, Easter celebration where we're celebrating the resurrected Jesus, our Savior. And uh, thrilled to have you here. If you're kind of new around here, my name is Matthew, one of the pastors. And it's always a delight uh, to be here. We're, we're beginning kind of a new collection of teachings through the book of 1 John. So if you've got a copy of the scriptures, join me in 1 John. Chapter 1 is where we'll be. 1 John 1, we're just going to read uh, four verses this morning and kind of jump into it. Uh, if you didn't bring a copy of scripture, not to worry. We've got some uh, uh, out there if you want to pick up one on your way out. Or you can follow along on the screens or on your device there. First John 1, starting in verse 1. This is the words of John, a letter from John. John the apostle, the one who followed Jesus, the one who is there at the resurrection, the one who uh, beat Peter to the tomb, the one who held the folded cloth and all those things, he is writing and he says this, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We, we saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Somebody say life. The one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him, and we now testify and proclaim that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us, and we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father, and it's with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that these are indeed your words. You are indeed alive. And Lord, that the joy that comes from knowing you can be ours. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. One of the things um, that you may or may not know of, about me is um, I'm number two of six in a family. So, so I have uh, several other brothers and sisters, all married, all kind of uh, in there. So when our families get together, it's number one, loud. Uh, it's number two, full of laughter and joy. Like, it's nonstop. There's plenty of sarcasm to go around for sure. Feelings are rarely hurt because we just know kind of what it's like to be in one another's presence. And we love gathering. We love playing games. We love celebrating. And just joy is a mark of our gatherings when we get to all be together. Uh, I, I think joy is the mark um, or probably one of the words that we ought to use more often to describe Jesus. Uh, Jesus just, I think, always uh, had a smile. I think he enjoyed smiling. I think he enjoyed life. I don't think he took himself too, too seriously by any means, although he was serious about what he was commissioned to do and why he was here on the earth without a doubt. One of the things lately that's kind of been, just been making uh, me laugh and me chuckle is... Uh, hearing the scripture translated into like Gen Z language. Have you seen this uh, out, out and about? It's not really a Bible I would recommend doing a deep study on or trying to really, really get to know Jesus through, but it is kind of humorous, and I can see people reading some scripture to Jesus in this language and him just like laughing and having a good time with it. Let, let me read you an excerpt from the Gen Z Bible. Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 7, like the whole resurrection thing, says this. The angel said to the woman, don't freak out. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one who was crucified, but he's not here, fam. He's risen just like he said. Check it out, the spot where they laid him. Yo, go tell his crew and his peeps that he's out here in Galilee chilling. They'll catch him, no cap.
Now, I don't know if your introduction to following Jesus or engaging with the family of God is one full of joy. I don't know if your family gatherings are full of joy or not. Maybe your gatherings are a little bittersweet right now because the one person who made it so fun in your family is no longer present. Maybe gatherings are a little less joyful for you because um, when you uh, gather with your family, there's nothing but tension because bitterness has been the defining word for all of your relationships in your family. And you're just waiting and hoping a fight doesn't break out because someone said something stupid after having one too many. Maybe your family gatherings are anything but joyful because you feel alone and isolated and forgotten. John is writing and he wants you to believe in Jesus so that you can fully receive the joy that goes beyond anything that comes from having right communion and fellowship not only with God but God's family the Bible says that he takes the lonely and he places them in a family the center of our Easter celebration like Jesus's version not the bunny's version like The central theme of celebrating Jesus and the resurrection is this, that Jesus is God and Jesus rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. This is the central reason why they were celebrating. John was writing and he was at the empty tomb holding the folded grave clothes. He was, he was there when Jesus walked into the room post-resurrection. He was there when Jesus ascended into the heavens and he said he would come again. He was there for those things. And he's writing so that we too might believe in the Son of God and find real joy because we can have fellowship with this same Jesus. This truth is why the disciples died and put their life on the line. They didn't die because they did miracles, which they did. They didn't die and give their lives because they gathered in public and in private homes, which they did. They didn't die because they helped the poor and lived sacrificially giving of their resources for the kingdom purposes, which they did. No, they died because they were willing uh, to declare in an uncompromising way that Jesus is God and Jesus rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. That's why they gave their life. And John wants us to know that in order to receive this joy, in order to, to find a full, complete joy in this fellowship with God, to have this kind of joy that, that is not circumstantial, but rooted in the centrality of who Christ is. If we're going to have that joy, there are some things that we must receive and believe about this man, Jesus. Here's what I want you to understand today on this Resurrection Sunday. That Jesus' resurrection paves the way for us to experience resurrection one day too. Like this is why we have hope as followers of Jesus. This is why we um, have such joy even in the face of the certainty that we will all die one day. Because the resurrected Jesus paves the way for us to experience resurrection one day day to listen to the words of Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 he, he writes starting in verse 12 he says this but tell me this since we preach that Christ rose from the dead why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection from the dead for if there is no resurrection from the dead then Christ has not been raised either he's getting a little Uh, saintly sarcasm coming out of his pen right here. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. And we apostles should, would all be lying about God, for we have all said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are now completely lost. And and if our hope in Christ is for only this life, 
we are more to be pitied than anyone else. No, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who will die. So you see, just as death came into the world through one man, now resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because they belong to Adam, or in other words, they belong to the human race, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who believe in Christ will be raised when he comes back. This is what Paul wants us to see. This is what John and the other disciples believe. This is some of the essential truths that, that resurrection was, wasn't just for Jesus. It's a guarantee for the rest of us who have placed our faith and believe these essential truths about Jesus. That one day your corruptible body will be raised up to new life eternal. That's good news and ought to give us a little bit of a smirky smile. This is the centrality of the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done. It's not just some cool party trick that he emptied the tomb and rose again. This is life on the line eternally for us. There are four essential truths that we believe about Jesus that gives us the ability to receive this resurrection life. In other words, without believing these things, the receptivity of resurrection life one day is not yours. These are essential for us to hold to. Here, here's essential truth number one. Jesus existed from the beginning, which makes him God. He was there in the very beginning creating the world. He was there with the Father and the Spirit when the cosmos were formed, when trees came about. He was there when the elephant came to be and smirking like a middle schooler when he created the aardvark. <laughs> like, he has always been and will always be. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is from the beginning, which makes him God. The disciples believe this. We believe this about Jesus and you can believe this about Jesus here's the second truth that's really essential to resurrection life and that's this that Jesus came in the flesh which makes him a man he was God and he's also man have you ever had a hard time trying to wrap your mind around something like maybe you were in the middle of doing a home renovation and uh, your, your spouse was like, oh, and we can move this wall and then we can create this and then we can move this beam here and it's all here. And you're like nodding your head and smiling like, yeah, yeah. Cha-ching, 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 right? Like, but you're having a hard time really grasping what it is that they're trying to sell you on. Like you're having a hard time wrapping your brain and comprehending what that's going to look. Maybe you're, you spent some time trying to troubleshoot a, a technological problem and you just can't for the life of you imagine how this is supposed to work. And it's just hard to grasp. When Jesus came in the flesh, he came to embody and live as a living example for us to grasp and see what it looks like to have a relationship with the eternal father. Like the world was having a hard time figuring out this faith in Yahweh. What it looked like to be loyal to him and not be loyal to the culture around them. They were having a hard time trying to figure out what life was supposed to look like with God the Father central to who they were, receiving their full worship and glory. They could not wrap their minds around it because their lives were not living it. So he sent his son to become a man, to live an embodied existence. This is what scripture claims about Jesus, that he came as God in the flesh and became man. Now, you might be sitting there and like you're a little skeptical. You're like, okay, okay, preacher dude. Um, first, put on some socks. That's weird. <laughs> and two, I don't really think the Bible is trustworthy. Why would I live in 2024 and trust some ancient text written by some old dudes who have no understanding of what it is. Well, 
Here's what you need to understand, that scientifically, there's a process called scientific textual criticism. Scientific method that proves the reliability of any and every ancient text used to decide whether or not your history book that you use in school should be trusted or not. I want to show you a clip from an alpha series uh, where they're talking about this very thing, the Jesus scientific is criticism. Take a look. These streets around 2,000 years ago. But is there any evidence that he even existed? Well, there's actually quite a lot of evidence. No serious historian would deny that Jesus existed. The Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius wrote about Jesus, as did the first century Jewish historian Josephus. He described him as Jesus, a doer of wonderful works. And then he goes on to describe his crucifixion and alleged resurrection. So there's evidence outside of the New Testament for the existence of Jesus, but most of the evidence comes from within inside the New Testament. And sometimes people say, well, the New Testament was written such a long time ago. How do we know what was written down hasn't been changed over the years? Well, the answer is that we do know because of a science called textual criticism. Textual criticism examines a number of copies of early texts that we have available to us today. And it looks at the time gap between the original document and the earliest copy that we have. And basically, the more manuscripts we have and the earlier they are, the less doubt there's going to be about the original. So let's compare the Bible to other texts in ancient history, ones that are widely used in schools and universities. Let's look at the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. They both wrote in the 5th century BC. But the earliest copy of their writings that we have dates from AD 900, and that makes a 1,300-year time lapse. And even then, we only have eight copies of these manuscripts in the first place. Or look at the Roman historian Tacitus. There's a thousand-year gap between his book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies. Or another classic, Caesar's Gallic War, 950 years between the book being written and our first manuscript copy. And even then, we only have nine or ten copies of these manuscripts. Again, with Livy's famous History of Rome, a 900-year gap between the book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies of this. But when it comes to the New Testament, well, it's very different. The New Testament was written between about 40 and 100 AD, and we have manuscript evidence going back as early as 130 AD, and full manuscripts by 350 AD. And we have more than 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin translations, and 9,300 others. So, you know, we can be pretty confident in the accuracy, the authenticity, and the integrity of the New Testament scriptures that have been passed down to us today. The remarkable thing about the Bible is there's such a short chronological distance between the events being described and our first manuscripts. So in many ways, the Bible scholars are in a very fortunate position of being able to check these things out and finding that they are much more reliable than, for example, some of the alternatives you're looking at. And as a scholar, I am more than happy to say, I trust this, I take it very, very seriously, I rely on it. Professor F.J.A. Hort, one of the greatest scholars in the area of textual criticism, concluded that, in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose writings. And no secular historian would disagree with that conclusion. So we know from evidence outside and inside the New Testament that Jesus existed. But who was he? Well, we know that he was fully human. He had a human body. He ate, he drank, he sweated, he got tired, he suffered pain. And he had human emotions, love, joy, sadness, and human experiences. He had the experience of growing up in a family, of education, of having a job, of being tempted. And he experienced bereavement and suffering and torture and even death. Many today will say, okay, he was a human being, but only a human being. Maybe he was a great religious teacher, but no more than that. Others would say he was much more than that. Bono, the lead singer of the band U2, has said, I don't think you're led off easily by saying he was a great thinker or philosopher, because actually he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God, or he was nuts. 
And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth for nearly 2,000 years, have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I don't believe it. He went on to say, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus came in the flesh, which makes him man. Here's the central truth number three. Jesus died in the flesh, which makes him our redeemer. The other day, uh, we ran into yet some more car trouble on uh, my car. Uh, those of you that have been around, you've maybe heard some of our saga of car troubles, uh, which always just makes me feel so good since I'm so competent with such things. <clears throat> but like... We ended up taking it to a, a local place, and they, they ran a test, and my wife sends me a text and says, hey, it's the battery. Uh, the guy ran a test and says, the battery's like dead, like dead, dead. I'm like, oh, dead, dead, cool, great. Friends, when Jesus died, he like died, died, like dead, dead. <laughs> like blood and water flowed from his side. He took his last breath. Like they didn't put him in the tomb half dead. He was in the tomb, dead, dead. And because he died in the flesh, it makes him our redeemer. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. We, we've turned everyone to his own way. See, the, the problem with humanity and the reason we need a redeemer is from the very beginning, man rejected the ways of God and decided to live based on their own knowledge of good and evil, trying to live instead of as a created being, tried to be a divine being equal with God, making our own creative decisions. We, we bucked the creative order, and as a result, we have all turned our own way. What is good to my life? What do I feel is true? What do I think is right? What do I feel about this or that? Frankly, what you think and feel about it doesn't change what is true and who God is. And as a result, that's called sin. And in this place, the scripture goes on to say, in his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, the one who's gone his own way, uh, he's laid that iniquity on Christ for us all. It's the idea that on this hand, something was placed. It was sin. It was you and me in our lives. And God took the, the iniquity that we were living in because we go our own way, and he picks it up, and he transfers it, and he places it in the hand of his son. And laid on him the sins of us all dying on this cross. And because Jesus died in the flesh, taking on your sin, placed on him by the Father, we can now be redeemed because of the sacrifice. This is an essential truth that we receive and believe in so that we might have resurrection life one day when Christ returns and makes all things new and vanquishes evil from our very midst. Here's essential truth number four. Jesus rose in the flesh and ascended into heaven, which makes him our risen savior who can renew all things. He rose in the flesh. It wasn't some spiritual experience. It was an embodied physical resurrection. Put your hands here, he told them. Touch this, hear this, see this. And the apostle says, we've seen it with our own eyes. If you go and you read some more at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, which we read earlier, Paul lists several people by name as like, hey, this person saw him, and this person was there and, and heard him speak, and this person saw him after the rest, and lists name after name after name after name after name of people that you could go and verify with them and be like, hey, yo, um, they're saying like Jesus rose again. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was there. It's kind of like when somebody sends you a, a Facebook invite and you're like, I think they got hacked. Like I'm going to ask it, hey, did you really send this or is this a robot from, from Russia trying to like get some stuff? And they're like, no, no, it's me. It's legit. Oh, okay. And you verify it. These people were alive and could verify what they saw, what they heard. There are four kind of rational reasons 
that I believe that we as Christians have for fully believing that Jesus rose in the flesh. Let's go back to this Alpha series and hear about these four rational reasons. Watch this. There are four pieces of evidence for the resurrection. The first is his absence from the tomb. No one has ever satisfactorily explained how Jesus' body was absent from the tomb that first Easter day. People have come up with all kinds of explanations. For example, maybe the authorities stole the body. Well, in that case, why didn't they produce it when people started saying that he'd risen from the dead? Or perhaps the robbers stole the body. But when the disciples heard that Jesus had, had been seen, they ran to the tomb and they found that the tomb was not empty. Inside the tomb were the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in. The only valuable thing that a robber might have taken was still there. The grave clothes had collapsed like a caterpillar's cocoon when a butterfly has emerged. And the piece that had been around Jesus' head had been folded up and put in a different place. And when they saw that, they believed. The second was his presence with the disciples. Jesus was seen on more than 11 occasions, on one occasion by a group of around 500 people. People say, well, it could have been a hallucination. Well, hallucination does happen among highly strong, very nervous or highly imaginative people, or people who are sick or are on drugs. But the disciples don't fit any of those categories. They were cynics like Thomas. There were tough fishermen, there were tax collectors, and tax collectors do not hallucinate. The third piece of evidence is the transformation that we see in the disciples. Here was a group of people who were disillusioned, despairing that their leader had died, and then suddenly they were transformed. They started saying, we've seen Jesus, he's really alive. And they went around telling everybody. Later on, practically all of them were killed, crucified, tortured, beheaded because of what they believed. And if they were deceiving people, all they had to do was say, no, 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 it's not actually true. But they never said that because they knew it was true. It had totally transformed their lives. And as a result, this extraordinary movement swept around the whole known world. And it's a movement without precedent in the history of humanity. And fourth, it's still happening today. There are now over 2.3 billion Christians around the world of every ethnicity, continent, nationality, economic, social and intellectual background. They all speak of this encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. My dad died a couple of years ago after about eight years of suffering from dementia and it was by far the hardest thing that we as a family have had to deal with. In those times, I remember asking seriously questions like, why? Why him? Why us? Why now? What possible purpose could that have? How could God allow that to happen to him? How can God allow that to happen to anyone? How can suffering happen when God loves us? And that's how it felt, was God was far away. And, and yet it's important to ask those questions. Being a Christian, believing in God doesn't mean you can't have doubts and ask questions the whole time. You know, Jesus himself cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But actually it was on the cross, it's the death, the suffering of Jesus and his death on the cross, which I found gave me not a complete answer, but some help as I was going through that. Because it helped me understand that God's not aloof, far away, sitting on some cloud, but actually he came in Jesus and suffered himself. He knows what it's like to suffer and he died. And therefore he understands what we're going through. If we're suffering, he's with us in that suffering. The resurrection of Jesus shows us that death's not the end. That ultimately, Jesus has defeated death. And that even though we might suffer now, one day, there'll be no more suffering. And there'll be no more pain. Jesus rose in the flesh. 
He ascended into heaven, which makes him our risen Savior who renews all things, including your suffering and sorrow, including the pain that we experience in this world, including the fragments of our soul that gets broken because some other broken person has been unrelenting and evil in our lives. The the fractures of our world are made new. Friends, I believe Jesus is the resurrection life for us all. And we can receive that promise of resurrection life one day. In fact, Jesus himself said that he is resurrection life. In John 11, he, he goes, you see a story of uh, Jesus interacting with Mary and Martha who just lost and buried their brother Lazarus. Been in the tomb for several days. He too was dead, dead. And Jesus shows up on the scene and these, these women are grieving. They are hurting. They are broken. They, their grief has turned them into a place where they can't even see the goodness of God anymore. And Jesus looks at Martha in John 11 and verse 25 and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Listen to this next phrase. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. This is the Christian hope. This is why we have joy, even in a world wrought with suffering and pain. And he says, everyone who believes in me will never die. What is he talking about? Many translations use this word eternal life. Have you ever heard that word before, eternal life? Throughout Jesus' teachings, he uses the phrase kingdom of God, eternal life, and salvation interchangeably to, to talk about the same kind of thing. It, the word eternal life doesn't mean heaven in terms of the afterlife when you die, though. It doesn't mean the result of something you have because you pray to sinner's prayer and walk down an aisle one day. It's not really about qua- quantity of life near as much as it is about the quality of life that begins now and is ongoing into the life in the world that is to come. It's a compound word, eternal life. The, the word eternal in the Greek is the word ahi neos. It means perpetual. In other words, it's used to talk about something that is in the past, but also in the, in the future. It's, it has been, and it will be ongoing into the future. The word life is the Greek word zoe, which is more than just natural life. It's also like an enriched life to come. It's, it's really, um, Jesus has used this word in conjunction to talk about abundant life. In other words, it's God's energizing life now and ongoing. So, so when you can bring these two words, ahi, neos, and zoe together, Jesus is trying to convey an idea that there is God's energizing life that comes into you now, begins to renew and recreate who you are on the inside, and that work is ongoing until the day he returns and renews all things. It begins now, and it is ongoing into the life in the world to come when Jesus returns. It is the resurrection life in which he is promising us. Jesus defines eternal life for us a little later in John 17 and verse 3, and he says this, and this is eternal life, that they know you, Father. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life isn't just something that happens one day, it's someone you get to know today. Eternal life is the person, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the eternal life we receive and can know. The question is, do you know Jesus? Not do you know about Jesus. Almost every American knows about Jesus. You wouldn't probably be here if you didn't know something about Jesus. Like if you thought Easter service was about bunnies doing things on a stage, you probably wouldn't be here. 
You know it has something to do about Jesus. You know about Jesus. My question is, do you like, do you know, know Jesus? See, you can know about some things about my wife, but you don't know my wife like I know my wife. Like there's a, there's a knowledge and insight about her that you don't know, but I do know that. This is the word that Jesus is trying to convey to us, that there is, a, there is a difference between having intellectual awareness about something and having an integrated embodied experience because you know no somebody. And Jesus is saying, if you want to have this flourishing life, this God-energizing life now that carries you on perpetually into the life and the world that is to come when he returns and renews all things, it is found only in an intimate, acquainted, embodied relationship with Jesus, with the Father, with the Son, and with the Spirit. This is what Jesus is trying to get us to understand, that we can begin to experience this flourishing life now, which is a foretaste of the complete flourishing life that will come without measure later when heaven and earth are renewed at the resurrection and the return of Jesus. The resurrection of the believers at the return of Jesus. John Ortberg said it like this. To know God is to live in a rich moment-by-moment gratitude-soaked participatory life together. Here's the tension. All that sounds really great in theory, doesn't it? But you probably have some points of pain right now where joy doesn't seem to be the defining word that you would use. It all sounds wonderful, but we struggle to reconcile this idea that there's evil now. Sure, it might be gone later, but why would a loving God allow it now? And you have questions and you have things that you're looking for and suffering that you're trying to find answers to. Here's what I need you to understand when it comes to the pain and the suffering in our world. Every world religion has tried to answer this question, but no answer really suffices. And I don't believe that Christianity and the God of the Bible actually tries to solve once and for all this great mystery. But it does have a response that's better than any other response. And the response is exactly what Jesus did with Martha. Here's his response You're in pain and you're grieving. She asked all these questions. Why? If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you did this, this wouldn't have happened. And she was hurling all the accusations about him in the midst of her grief. And Jesus doesn't actually answer any one of her accusations. You know what he does? He shows up in his present and weeps with her instead. See, the response to pain and suffering in our world from God has been the same from the very beginning of time. You know what it is? He shows up personally in your pain and is present with you. That's the response that God gives. Personally shows up in the midst of it. Like any good parent, when they hear their young one crying, they don't walk into the room as the child is crying and rationalize, well, you know, if you wouldn't have put your finger in the crib, you wouldn't have been hurt. Like like they're not rationalizing the pain of their infant. You know what they're doing? They grab them in a caring embrace and say things and whisper to them and love them and give them the gift of safe presence. And this is what your heavenly father does and has done. God does not try to rationalize your pain and nor will I. He just chooses to be present with you in the midst of your pain. That's why God sent his son to leave the convenience and beauty of the throne of heaven to enter the brokenness of our world to be present with us. To show us the way to have an enriching relationship. God's response to our wondering and our doubts is always the same. He gives us his presence. He turns his face towards us and is gracious to us. He gives us love when we don't deserve it, and he gives us his presence when we can't earn it. He shows up in our world. This is seen maybe perhaps never more clearly than in the story of Job. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Job. 
Job is a really fascinating read in the Old Testament. Job was a man who had everything together. He was wealthy. His kids were growing and successful. He had land and possessions. He, he was wealthy beyond all measure, and life was full of joy for him until it wasn't. And the pain of his life where everything began to be stripped away from him. His children die. He loses his cattle. Things burn. He he loses all of his possessions, and then his health itself begins to deteriorate. And he's stricken with all these unthinkable diseases and is just lost and confused in it and continues to realize, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And towards the latter part of Job, he begins to demand an audience with the Almighty. I want to talk to the Almighty. I want to settle this. I want to know why this is happening to me. And he gets his wish. In Job 38 through 42, he has an audience with the Almighty himself. And God shows up in a whirlwind, and he begins to look at Job and says, Job, where were you when I formed it all? Were you present When I created the cosmos, do you know what's going on in the realms that you can't see? Were you there? Can you even try to understand how I send rain and where I store up the hail for when it is needed? Do you even know? Can you yourself jump tame Leviathan and the behemoth, which were terrifying in their own right to them? Can you do that, Job? Answer me. And Job replies to God, the Almighty. And he says, I was talking about things I I knew nothing about. My accusations, the things I hurled at you, the, the, the concept of trying to understand something that only a divine can know that I'm a created being, not a divine being. And I'm meddling in affairs that I know nothing of. And then he responds this way. For I had only heard of you Yahweh before but now I have seen you with my eyes I've seen you with my eyes I take it all back and I repent C.S. Lewis said it like this in his book Till We Have Faces he says I ended my first book with the words no answer I know now Lord why you utter no answer for you are the answer before your face questions die away what other answer would suffice you're here and you've got questions about life about pain about suffering about evil you have doubts is he resurrected is he real is he there in the face of your questions can I tell you what God wants to do in response It's not give you a a logical answer. He wants to give you his gracious presence and be present in your life, creating eternal, resurrected, abundant, flourishing life, even in the midst of a non-flourishing world and situation. He gives you the gift of himself. Friends, the deepest hunger of the human heart is not answers to our logical questions. The deepest longing of the human heart is for God himself. You were created with an infinite capacity to be loved, to be known. And that infinite capacity must be met and filled from an infinite being of which no human is except Jesus, who was from the beginning, who came in the flesh, who died a death that you deserved and rose again ascended into heaven so that you and I can have the promise of everlasting life. Why? Because Jesus is where joy really is found. You won't find joy anywhere else. Only in this relationship with Jesus will you find joy. Jesus is the resurrection life and he can revive the joy that you feel like you've lost in your life. I love watching people get baptized. See some pictures from some of our baptisms. One one thing that is consistent among those who come up out of the water is they have this smile that is hard to describe on their face for so long. 
not just in the moments immediately following them up out of the water, but you talk to them in the lobby in the days after, and you talk to them and there's just this joy about them because they are radiant with a life not their own. They've received this newness of life inwardly now that is ever growing and flourishing into the life in the world that is to come. They've received eternal life. They've received the life of Jesus. They've received the life of God in them and it flourishes and it beams in joy. Friends, this is what it looks like. How do we find this joy? How do we find these things? Well, John writes and says, there are some essentials that you need to hold on to and grab and understand and believe. This word believe means to embody and live, not just intellectually understand. This is where we surrender and we make Christian confession that allows us to experience the fellowship and communion with him. Would you pull out your communion elements that you received when you came in? If you didn't receive elements, our, our hosts are coming by. Just kind of wave at them. They'll make sure you get some. Go ahead and open up the bread first. We're going to come to the table of the Lord. You can then flip it over and open up the juice if you'd like. I want to put up on the screen a portion of the Nicene Creed. We recited it this morning at the beginning of our service. This one section about Jesus. See, to experience life eternal, flourishing life requires us to confess and believe that the person of Jesus is who he said he is, to believe these essential truths. I want you to see the words on the screen as I read them. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes just for a second. My question is, do you know Jesus? Now, do you know about him? But do you have this ever-living, ever-growing, personalized, encountered experience with the real Jesus? Have you surrendered doing it your way? Or are you still trying to live your own way? Today, if you want to receive this life eternal, the first step is surrender. Right there in your seat, you can just simply surrender to the Lord. Say, Jesus, I believe you are all these things and more. And I long for your life. God, if we long for joy and life eternal, the only way we receive that kind of joy is through a relationship, a fellowship, of communion. We read at the top, Lord, that these things were written about Jesus so that our joy may be complete and full. So, Lord, many in this room are longing for joy. May we find it in the person of Jesus today. As we surrender and confess, Jesus, you are all of these things and more. Lord, the bread that represents your body broken for us, we take this communion meal as an act of surrender, of re-surrender, of recommitment, of realigning ourselves with you, the person that you are. We receive your life today as we take this bread. 
Let's take the bread together. Lord, this cup represents the forgiveness of your blood poured out on the Calvary's cross. Lord, we receive this, making us right with you in a way that allows us to really receive the fullness, the new wine of your spirit in our lives, the, the person of who you are fully alive in us. So Lord, make us new like never before today. We confess in who you are, Jesus. And we receive this together. Let's take the cup. I mean, would you stand with us? As you stand, our hosts will come and collect. Um, actually, they'll, they'll grab, guys, you grab one on the way out. I told you that's what we were doing. Just hold on to these on your way out. They'll collect these empty cups. Thanks for being here today. We end each of our services pretty much the same, speaking the blessing of God, the life of God, the, the newness of what God is and his presence in our lives. We speak this over each other. So we're gonna share this up it's up on the screen. I'd love for all of us to read it together. If you're here and, man, you need prayer for anything, we got a team over here. They would love to pray with you when we dismiss. And we'd love to see all of you back next Sunday as we keep walking through the scriptures, learning more about who Jesus is together and the joy that comes from him. But let's speak blessing over one another. It's on the screen. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.